Morning everybody and welcome back to Dyslexia Scotland at home up in Aberdeenshire. You're very welcome again this morning into my dining room. I've got William again behind the camera. Thanks very much once more William and Amelia's with me as well to demonstrate some activities with you this morning. Today's focus is on reading and we're going to look at three different elements to reading today. The first one is phonological awareness, second one is fluency and then we're going to look at some reading materials together and show you how to do some paired reading activities as well as how to perhaps deal with some of the comprehension activities that you're getting at home at the moment. So once again, come on in and have a look at what we've got on the table today. So we're going to start with the phonological awareness side. So phonological awareness and reading, it very much starts with language enrichment and conversation. So having a very simple conversation is going to build vocabulary. And you can do that by talking about almost anything, your daily activities during the day. Conversations are sometimes quite difficult for some children to get started. So you could give some conversation starters. Now I've got here some conversation cubes and I've used these all the way from primary one, primary seven and beyond. Again, you don't have to buy all of these things, you can make them, but it's a bit of a fun. It, everything of course is visual, auditory and kinesthetic that we do. So we can roll this on the table and see what we've got. And it says here, what foods do you like, Amelia? Chinese. Chinese, okay, I really like Chinese food. And then we can spark a whole conversation about food, about cooking, about anything that goes with it. So just having that conversation, making up your own little post-it notes with a topic of conversation on it, gets language enrichment going. Now rhyme is something that is part of phonological awareness that is really important in, in the reading element. And rhyme starts really early on with nursery rhymes, but it takes some children a very long time to understand rhyme. Now rhyme is relevant when we're reading because we're looking for patterns. We're always looking for connections in the words that we're learning and that we're reading. So rhyme is a great way of looking for that first stage of patterns. And again, you can practice any of these at home using whatever materials you've got right now. I've gone straight back to the good old paper cups that we saw in the last session. And you can look for rhyme using words such as these and perhaps looking for the odd one out. So this is a great game you could play. We've got can and man and son here. And then I would say to Amelia, well, Amelia, which one's the odd one out? Which one would you find? Choose one of those. So, yes, yeah, son, that's great. And then we can make it even more tactile and kinesthetic by placing the two rhyming cups together. And we can make any words with this. You can use this for the older children as well. If you had something, for example, as friend, send and band, this illustrates that some words still rhyme, but they may not actually look the same as part of their spelling. So friend, send and band, Amelia, which one would be the odd one out? <clears throat> The band that's right so then we would categorize these two together and again you can take this one step further by categorizing a list of words now I've got some pre-printed words here but you can again make these at home so I've got dress and huff and fell and this is showing us that we're looking for the end of the word to rhyme so again if I was going to look at these I can start then asking Amelia to put these into categories so I would start the categories off for her, dress and bell and huff, and then I would ask her to take some of these and put them into the categories. So Amelia, where would you categorise your fell? Which group would that one go into? That's right, yeah. And uh, we haven't got one for that one in, your, in the fluff. Which one would that go with? Yeah, perfect. And then perhaps you've got one there that categorises with the... So she's linking, she's making connections, and she's categorizing her words. And again, another way then, you could take these words and have a very simple game of snap. So you could take your normal playing cards, for example. You could stick some words on the back of those playing cards and then have a game of snap. So if I give you half the pack there, Amelia, if I turn the first one over, Fell and huff. So we'll bring in an auditory element now by asking us to read these words, fell and huff, and we know that they don't rhyme. Have we got another word that's going to go on top? Is it your turn or my turn? <laughs> okay, bell, bell and huff, no rhyme again. Bell and fluff, no rhyme. I don't think we're going to get a rhyme, are we? Dress, your turn. Bang, mess, keep going. Wing. And uh, you've got a snap. Fantastic, well done. Okay, 
And rhyming, of course, comes in poetry. It comes in stories and anything you've got at home, make up some stories that the end word rhyme, something as simple as the roll dal, revolting rhymes are great because they're fun. It's turning that rhyming phonological awareness into a book, into a book, into a story and into fun. Or something like a dinosaur story. These are lovely, the Deedlefist stories by Simon Hill. He tells the story of a dinosaur and everything in here is rhyming. Now he knew the crocodile couldn't cope and was about to give up hope. So lots of lovely stories, maybe favourite stories if your children like dinosaurs, for example. Okay, so we're still on the phonological awareness. We're still talking about what elements do we need to understand in the English language to then pick up that book and understand what we're reading. We've done some rhyme. We've done a little bit of language enrichment. And we're now going to look at something called syllables. And syllables we've spoken about briefly in the past, but there are many, many different kinds of syllables. And one area you could do is something as simple as counting the syllables. Now, counting syllables means how many claps can you hear in a word? So if we were to practice the word butterfly, butterfly would be butterfly, three claps. Or you could just simply hold your chin and count how many times your chin moves butterfly, so three movements of the chin. If we then wanted to make this more visual, auditory and kinesthetic, you could use a, a solid out article element, whatever you want to do, to see how many syllables you've got. So for Amelia, if we're going to make the word butterfly, you're going to put the amount of syllables back into the bucket there. So butterfly, how many syllables do we need? Three. Yes, so butterfly. And you'd make that an auditory and a visual and a kinesthetic um, um, exercise by saying the word at the same time. Syllable deletion is another great phonological awareness skill to have. So if I just get willing to have a look at these on the table for me, I've made it visual here by putting some pictures on here. These are actually compound words. These are two words that have been shoved together to make one word. And what I would ask is, if this is the word butterfly, if I take away the word fly, what have I got left here? Butter. Good, so I've taken one element of the syllable away and we can recognise the fact that butter is part of the syllable and fly comes in then to make the whole word. And similarly with ladybird, if I took away lady, what would I be left with? Bird. Bird, that's right, fantastic. So I've got lady and bird coming in there to make syllable deletion. It's another great activity for phonological awareness. And the last element now that's coming in on the phonological awareness side before we move on to fluency is making words, making them bigger, adding suffixes, adding prefixes, and it's morphology. This is moving words around, making words out of words. Again, I've got a little bit of a word train going on here, but you don't have to use a train. You can use anything that your children are interested in. So for example, here I've put a root word in the middle, which is the main part of the word called usual. So this is a little bit nicer for some of the older children, but you can use it for the younger ones as well. So Amelia, if I wanted to add something to the word usual to make it longer, what could I put at the front of that train, for example? Un. Yeah, so un. So she's made the word un. Usual, and she can see there's two syllables there, and if you put them together, it makes the word unusual. And what about on the end of that word? What could we do to make it a little bit longer? Fab, so what have you made now? Unusually. Unusually. So by adding a prefix and a suffix to the root word, Amelia has made a bigger word. Okay, so, so far we have looked at phonological awareness, which are the prerequisite type of activities needed for reading. They're all really important. Rhyme, syllable counting, syllable deletion, and just having a conversation. Language enrichment all the time, listening to each other. Fluency is something that you can practice by using individual words before you start putting them into stories and into books. And fluency is repetition. It's recognition of words, seeing them all the time, over learning, over reading. And you can do that again in lots and lots of different ways. We could perhaps put, making it fun, as always, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, have a little net here. You could even have a bowl of water and put some plastic words or letters into a bowl. And then I would just invite Amelia to pick one out of the net and just simply read it.
What word have you got? Tape. She's got the word tape. Okay, so there's lots and lots of different words in here that I've literally just typed and cut up and put into my fishing net to make a fluency activity reading game. Or you could take another one of your goldfish bowls, have all your cards inside there, mix them up and take another one. And what have you got this time? It does. Okay, it does. So we put a few sight words in here as well, words that do not sound as they're spelt. And that again is great for just a daily one minute activity. That's all this takes. You can then perhaps start putting stuff onto boards. So if I can invite William to come over again and have a look at this one for me. This again is a very simple fluency board that I've printed off. And you can write on here every day the kind of words that you're thinking that are important with part of your reading or words that perhaps are not recognising each day. So words like when and what are quite tricky and you can take a different colour and highlight some of the words inside the words, building words up, identifying what's inside them, the word there and the word here. And these could just be words that you've decided that week to, to use and you could read those every day. Or again, we've gone for a bit of a train theme. We can start putting words onto things that make life a little more exciting. I've chosen some words here from a book that someone's been reading with the chest sound in. I put some tricky words on there and I put some of those smaller words that children often muddle up when they are reading a story because they look so similar. So that's reading fluency and fluency can be built up on a daily basis by very, very small activities like this, which is over learning, over repetition all the time. Okay, so I'm just gonna move all these to one side. And now we're gonna look at a variety of reading materials. And I think I mentioned to you in the past on the Parent Masterclass that reading is about reading anything. And your role at the moment as the parent is to bring back that love of reading. So you've got to have some fun and you've really got to find something that interests your children. What do they like to read? Some children really like books like Diary of the Wimpy Kid. I'm going to pop them on the table here for you to see, William. Diary of the Wimpy Kid are great. Uh, these um, Tom Gates books, because these are full of lots and lots of pictures and cartoons. And it turns the story into pictures as well, which is great for remembering and understanding what's happened. So if anybody wants to pick one of these up, I certainly wouldn't tell them that that's not the correct reading material because they are really, really good fun for some children. The Deco comics that are out at the moment that are um, actually free, issues 1 to 12 are free online at the moment. If you haven't seen these, these are curriculum based cartoon um, learning and they use a variety of topics to turn into uh, learning basically but learning and reading at the same time. So Deco Comics, another great way of bringing reading to life and reading for enjoyment. You could, if you wanted to, read and act out at the same time. So if you wanted to read a play, if your children enjoy reading plays, there's some lovely stories by Julia Donaldson that you can actually buy as a play and you can take a part each and act the story out. What better way of making reading fun and kinesthetic at the same time. Really, really very exciting. A lot of children really like doing plays and acting out their plays. There's some books that you can choose that will go with perhaps the, the vowels or the, the sounds that you're learning at the moment. And I've only chosen these because these are, some of these are free online at the moment as well. Some of these stories, you can download some of these books at the moment. So that's the Moondog series. And these follow an order of the phonics that you're learning. So if you're learning in this one, you might be learning the long E sound, for example. So the story will follow that sound. So these are really nice stories if you wanted to follow the sounds that you're learning in your spellings. The Barrington Stoke series I've mentioned to you before. Barrington Stoke have got an excellent uh, add-on to their website at the moment, which is helping you at home with your schoolwork. So they've got some activities on there. They can also help you to find the right reading level for your children. So pop along to their website at the moment. Now these books are great for the, the layout of them. They're nice grown up stories. They're very attractive covers. Inside the font is fantastic for anybody who's reading these. And um, there's a lovely gaps between the paragraphs and the background of this is cream. So it's often easier for a lot of children to read. So these are a nice selection of stories there. 
if you if your children enjoy reading or listening to stories such as Roald Dahl and Mark and Mapungo, well, one great thing to do is to learn about the author themselves as well. This often builds the big picture of what's coming in a story. Learning about the author is really interesting for many children. So you could look him up, look up Michael Mapergo and his life and why he wrote these stories. And most authors, especially these two, have a very interesting history that most children would really like to know about. So again, really, really nice stories. And while we're at home at the moment, I've sort of expressed to you in some of the other sessions that we've done that learning about dyslexia itself raises such amazing awareness and gives children a reason as to why they learn the way that they learn. And here's just a few books here that you could have a look at while you're at home. This one is a lovely book about stories of people who have dyslexia and perhaps why things happen the way they do. The Nessie and the Nessie um, websites have got some amazing stories on them. But again, it's all explained in cartoon form. It's a lovely story that you could share together. And this is another one that I've seen in the past. They do this one in pink as well. And this again explains dyslexia in what's happening and why people feel the way they feel. So a lot of investigative sort of stories there as well that you can use. Okay, so I'm just gonna move some of those out of the way because the next thing I'm gonna show you is comprehension. So at the moment, I think comprehension is coming home as part of an activity, but comprehension is actually a really important part of reading as well. Comprehension and reading need to sit side by side together. They're almost a married partner, if you like. When you're reading something, we need to understand what we're reading as well. So I'm just gonna show you a quick way of perhaps coping with the comprehension that's coming home from school at the moment. I've just got one activity here that I printed off yesterday. And this, this comes home in, in whatever form it does or the story, and it looks overwhelming. That's the first thing that happens. The whole thing looks completely overwhelming. So we need to break it down. And the first thing you're gonna do before you've even read it is start chunking the bits you're going to read and agree the bits you're going to read. You could even read it to them because listening to the story is just as good as reading the story. So the first thing I would do with a comprehension activity is build a big picture. What do I think this is all going to be about? So I've got some pictures of some horses up here. I've got a Trojan horse here as well. I'm starting to connect to the knowledge that I've already got on this story potentially. I'm not reading it at all at this stage. And then, then I'm gonna turn it over and I'm gonna go straight to the questions. So I'm gonna read the questions first before I've even read the text. So I've got an idea of what I need to look for. Then I'll turn it back over. Then I'm gonna chunk it and I'm gonna read a little bit at a time. This may be the point where you need to use a highlighter. So I get my highlighter and I'm gonna pick out what I think are the most important points. So here it says to me yesterday, the brave Greek army. So I might highlight Greek army. That might be an important point. Entered into Troy. Troy is undoubtedly gonna be important. And then I've got something here about 10 years. So I'm gonna highlight what's important to me. So I've got that standing out now, and then I can move my way through this piece of text. I might need to read it once or twice, but the second time I go back, I might just read my highlighted words rather than the whole thing. By the time I go back to the questions, I've got a much bigger idea of what I need to do. So that's one way of comprehension. When you're doing comprehension at home with your children and you're reading a story, you could perhaps ask each other questions by using just simple lollipop sticks. How did the story begin? What happened next? How did the story end? And these kinds of questions build up what the big picture is and understanding and sparks a conversation. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna do is look at some stories and I'm gonna sit and do some reading with Amelia now and we're gonna show you a few different ways of doing what's called paired reading. I've also got here some overlays. We talked very briefly about overlays last time. Now these overlays come in lots and lots of different colors and you can use these overlays on your story by either putting a sentence in the top part there or a paragraph in the bottom part. So here are three ways 
of doing paired reading with your children. So Amelia's chosen the story of Kensuke's Kingdom. And the first thing we could do to lighten the load a little bit is agree. Agree how many pages you're gonna read. So we might read two pages together. So by agreeing that, we've taken the anxiety away. We're reading two pages and we're just gonna enjoy those two pages and no more than that. And then we're gonna come up with an agreement of, well, shall we read a paragraph each? So that might be the first thing we do. So Amelia would read the first paragraph, I would read the second paragraph. Again, the anxiety is relieved. What if Amelia comes across a word that she absolutely doesn't know? I'm gonna give her three seconds. That's all I'm gonna give her, then I'm gonna tell her the word because the point of us reading together is to enjoy the story and share the story for comprehension. So I will tell her that word straight away so she doesn't need to worry about that word that's coming up. And this is a routine that she will get used to. So paired reading can come in many, many ways. And the other really great way, perhaps for some younger readers, is to sit your voice right underneath theirs. So as they're reading along, you're there like a big net just to catch those words and keep that reading going. So Mila and I are gonna demonstrate that kind of paired reading for you just now. I disappeared on the night before my 12th birthday, July 28th, 1988. Only now I can at last tell the whole ex extra, <laughs> extra extraordinary story. story, the true story. Perfect. So if there was a word in there that Amelia couldn't recognise, then I would simply catch that story for her and we would move on and just enjoy the story together. So that's it again for this week from Dyslexia Scotland at Home. Please enjoy reading, read to your children. It doesn't matter how old they are, reading to them is absolutely vital. But more than anything, please bring back that love of reading by having some fun. Thanks very much again for coming along. See you soon.